Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today I want to talk about why and how guns blow up. At this point I know a lot of you have seen the very sobering and very impressive video that uh, Scott over at Kentucky Ballistics just posted a day or two ago uh, about his Serbu RN50 exploding in his face. And that was one of the most impressive, uh, in a engineering sense, kabooms of a rifle that I've seen in a long time. I had a bunch of people asking me about various elements of it, and I thought this would be a good time to discuss the different ways that guns explode, because there are several different ways. They vary in their severity and in what causes them. So let's dig into that a little bit. The first thing we'll talk about here is what happened to Scott. And that is a failure of the rifle, a catastrophic failure of the rifle, when the whole system is locked and properly in battery. Um, in battery is a term that we use to indicate that basically the locking system is fully engaged. And the second type of malfunction or type of explosion we'll talk about is out of battery detonations. So the things in battery, and this happened to Scott, he put the cartridge in, uh, his rifle had a threaded on cap at the breech plug as a locking system screwed that all the way in. There's a safety mechanism on the rifle to ensure that the cap is in fact fully screwed in, all the threads are in engagement, um, and that, that worked as it should have. The problem was the cartridge that he put in that gun was way too high pressure for what that gun was able to handle. By the way, typical operating pressures for rifle rounds, including the 50 Browning machine gun round, are about 55,000 psi. This is an incredible amount of pressure, and I think a lot of us get very complacent about shooting about the fact that if you're chambering a rifle cartridge it's, it's 50,000 plus psi that's detonating, deflagrating technically, um, like a foot and a half from your face. Uh, we take that very casually often because we get used to it. Well the reality is that's a tremendous amount of energy, and you always want to make sure that it's being directed in the intended uh, path. So what happened to Scott was essentially a bore obstruction. And one way to look at this is that every single failure, every single explosion of a rifle that is in battery ultimately comes down to a bore obstruction. So the idea is when you fire that cartridge the gunpowder deflagrates, it burns very quickly, and it creates this huge pressure, uh, which is then used to push the bullet down the barrel and accelerate it to high velocity, and that's the whole point of a gun. However, if something prevents that bullet from going down the barrel, and pressure builds to the point, if it builds too high, you will sometimes get some other component of the rifle that fails. Or handgun. I'm going to be using rifle for most of this video, but this applies to handguns, shotguns, you name it. So. Uh, at Scott described this, the failure as something that uh, would have happened at about 85,000 psi, and that's a really, really hot round. Uh, but what happened to him was the pressure built because, uh, in this case, because there was too much powder burning too fast, or rather it was powder burning too fast. I do not know the chemical details of the M903 slap. Uh, rounds that he was using. Uh, some powders are more stable than others, some will deteriorate in safe ways, some will deteriorate in ways that make them higher pressure over time, and I just I don't know the details about the specific powder that was used in those rounds, or if someone had actually reloaded the projectiles into new brass with the wrong powder. I, I don't know. Ultimately it created high enough pressure that the threading on the end cap of that rifle sheared off, which is really quite impressive um, from an engineering perspective. That's a lot of engagement service and it just, it just sheared right off, because that was the path of least resistance rather than uh, accelerating the bullet down the barrel. If you've ever tried to like push a bullet through a barrel, it's not an easy thing. You actually have to engrave the rifling into the copper jacket of the bullet, or the lead if it's not jacketed, and that takes a lot of force. So. Um, what almost certainly happened is the bullet started moving, but it couldn't, uh, the pressure continued to build as the powder burned, and uh, the bullet was moving but hadn't gone far enough to decrease pressure by the time that it got high enough to rupture the end cap on the rifle. So uh, now I have gotten a bit off topic here. What I said initially was ultimately 
all of these failures come down to a bore obstruction. And the most common situation where we see this happening is someone literally plugs the bore of the gun. Um, one of the cliched things is some guy out hunting with a shotgun and accidentally trips and plugs the, the muzzle of the gun down into the mud and he's got a big plug of mud inside the muzzle of the gun. Well, if he doesn't clean that out before firing the gun, what will happen is the, the shot from his first round will hit that plug and it will stop, or it will substantially decelerate while it tries to push that plug out. The resulting pressure spike will cause some other part of the gun to fail, and kaboom. Uh, we see this, one of the other more common places we see this is with the accidental loading of a 300 blackout cartridge into a 5.56 chamber. It's not supposed to be able to happen with the original proper design of the bullet shape for a 300 blackout, but it does happen. Uh, there are a lot of ammunition loaded for 300 blackout that doesn't quite meet that specification. The problem there is essentially the cartridges are the same length. Um, I'm oversimplifying this. The cartridges are the same length, and so if you put a 300 in, it will jam the bullet into the beginning of the chamber. Uh, at just the right depth that the action will lock behind it and you can fire the round, but uh, what you're faced with is having to squeeze a 30 caliber bullet into a 223 caliber barrel. That is, that is the definition of a bore obstruction, and that cannot happen fast enough to prevent the back end of the gun from exploding. The pressure has to go somewhere, and on an AR it will typically break the upper receiver in half. Uh, in a really impressively catastrophic manner. So that's one of the other places we see an in-battery explosion of a firearm. Now usually on this sort of thing, especially with a shotgun, the weak point in the gun is the barrel itself. And so you'll see guns, rifles and shotguns. By the way, the other really common way this can happen uh, is if you accidentally leave a cleaning rod in the barrel. It may not seem like that's a big deal because hey, it's not even sealing the barrel, but that the extra inertia of having to accelerate that cleaning rod from a standstill will cause this to happen, and you will also see it sometimes in laser uh, bore sighters. There's a device, a little laser device, that you fit into the muzzle of the rifle and it projects a laser beam, and you put that in the gun and then you look through your scope and you can dial your scope onto that laser dot and get pretty close to an initial zero. Well if you do that and then forget to take your laser zeroing device out of the muzzle, you'll get this same thing, you'll get a bore obstruction. So anyway, uh, typically you'll see this as a failure of the barrel, and the barrels will be banana peeled open in, in all sorts of interesting and exotic ways. The problem on Scott Kentucky Ballistics, the problem for him, uh, one, well, one of many compounding problems, was that the barrel was stronger than the threading on the end cap of the action. And so the barrel was totally intact and fine, and the end cap blew off. Uh, and threw a bunch of shrapnel, a couple discrete pieces of shrapnel that hit him in uh, vital, squishy, important areas. Oh, by the way, he was both extremely unlucky that he managed to get hit uh, by... You know, there, there were three things that came back out of the back end of that gun, as far as I can tell from his video, and he got hit by two of them. Uh, he was both very lucky that the third one, which went like right through his hat, He's very lucky that didn't hit him in the head and kill him. He's also unlucky that the other two pieces did hit him. This is one of those situations that uh, could have gone tremendously better or tremendously worse very, very easily. Uh, also, I should say, both he and his father, who was there at the range filming with him, uh, clearly had the right mindset and the right reactions, because had either of them not been up to the challenge of how do you deal with a traumatic emergency on the range when you're just the two of there, two of you out there by yourself, uh, Scott very easily could have died on the range. It's a very sobering video to watch. Anyway, uh, so we don't tend to see a lot of catastrophic in-battery detonations of rifles, and there are some things that gun manufacturers have done over the years to try and prevent them. Uh, to well. It's not necessarily something you can fully prevent, because there's always going to be some unforeseen circumstance or some accident uh, that leads to a massively overpressure cartridge in a gun. Um, what, what proper manufacturers have done is come up with ways to fail safe their rifles, so that even in the event of a catastrophic malfunction, the gun will fail in a way that does the least amount of potential harm to the person holding it. So one good example of this would be John Browning's automatic pistols. 
what started off as the Colt 1900, where the slide can actually come back off the back end of the gun, and it's held in place just by one little metal wedge. When, they, when Browning improved that design to the style that we see in the 1911 today, uh, what he did was essentially require the slide to be disassembled off the front of the gun instead of off the back, uh, or there was no way to take the slide off the back, because he was able to integrate a bunch of metal into the front of the slide that would catch on the frame of the gun should there be some sort of catastrophic failure of the locking system and the slide comes flying back, so that it wouldn't hit the shooter in the face. We can also see that in the third lug, the safety lug so-called, on the Mauser system that was introduced. In many bolt-action rifle designs the bolt handle is actually located up here in front of the rear part of the receiver, and thus it acts as an emergency safety lug. Well, Mauser went through about 10 years of iteration and improvement to their basic bolt-action rifle design. And what we have here is an 1893 pattern, which does not have any sort of emergency lug back here. So should both of the two front locking lugs fail, in theory, the bolt can go flying out the back of the rifle. Is that a common occurrence? No, far, far from it. It's extremely uncommon. However, one of the improvements that Mauser made to the action, however, was circa 1895, and this is an 1898 pattern but still includes it, they added this third safety lug with a locking recess that you can just barely see right there. So when you put the bolt into battery, that third lug goes down and locks into the receiver. Now, it's not a head-spaced lug. Uh, it's not there primarily to actually seal the action on a regular basis, it is there simply as a safety mechanism. So again, if the front two lugs here both shear off through some massive overpressure event, this little third lug is enough to keep the bolt from coming out the back of the gun. In general, if you go look at basically any firearm, you will find that there is something that prevents the moving bits of that gun from coming straight back into the shooter. Uh, it may be a protrusion on uh, the receiver that, that takes the impact of a bolt or a bolt carrier or a slide. There are a thousand different ways that it's done, but it is extremely rare to find a gun where pieces can actually come straight off the back in a worst case failure. And so that's the idea of fail safing your gun designs. Now, there are a couple other, there are two other mechanisms of gun explosions that I want to talk about that are. I don't want to call them not severe, because they can be extremely severe, but they tend to be a little less energetic, and those are out-of-battery detonations. The idea there is something goes wrong that causes the cartridge to detonate when it's not fully locked in the chamber, aka it's not in battery. Um, one great example of where we can see this uh, is open bolt submachine guns. If they have a fixed firing pin and they fire from an open bolt, you basically are using the firing pin to push the cartridge into the chamber. It's not exactly how it happens, but it's close enough that every so often everything will line up just exactly wrong, and you'll get a cartridge where as the bolt is pushing that round into the chamber, there's enough pressure on from the firing pin onto the primer that it will detonate that cartridge. Um, I've actually had this happen to me a couple times. I got one of them on camera here uh, with an Austin uh, submachine gun, and on, a, on an open bolt submachine gun, it's typically not that big a deal. As long as you don't have your hand over the ejection port, nothing bad is going to happen. What will happen is uh, the, you know, the primer fires, the gunpowder starts to burn, and it doesn't get very high pressure before it ruptures the brass case. That was an out of battery. The way to think about one of these brass cases is it's essentially a sealing device. This isn't meant to be pressure containment, it's just meant, well, it is pressure containment, it's not meant to be the primary containment for the gas in, that develops inside when you fire. This is intended just to seal off the little tiny openings that, are, that always exist at the breech end of a breech loading gun. So like if you take your bolt action rifle and you close the bolt, you have sort of sealed the back end of the gun. You've got the metal of the bolt pushed up against the metal of the, the shoulder of the back of the barrel, the face of the back of the barrel, and it's not going to move, right? But it's not gas tight. Uh, if you were to just pour powder like a muzzle loader down in there and set it off somehow, uh, you would have gas that would go out the front, out the barrel, and it would also vent through the little gaps between the bolt and the breech face and come out the back. The whole purpose of a cartridge case 
well, one of the purposes, is to contain that. So the cartridge case is held inside a steel chamber, and it's that steel chamber that's actually providing the pressure containment. The brass is there to expand and become ga a gas-tight fit in the chamber when you fire the gun. And then the cool thing about brass is once the action, once the pressure has dropped and the bullet's gone, the brass will actually shrink back down mostly to its original size, which means it's easy to get the cartridge case out. It's a very convenient material. Before they used brass, they used copper for a short time. Copper turns out to be a little brittle, um, doesn't work as well, doesn't shrink back as well. Uh, we won't, you, you can actually use steel, aluminum, polymer, some other materials to do this. Brass is the best of them, and that's why it's used the most. At any rate, uh, when you have an out of battery detonation, what happens is instead of getting, instead of the pressure rising to the point that some component of the gun fails, the pressure only rises to the point where the brass fails. Because if it's out of battery, there is some element of exposed brass where it's just this cartridge case that's containing the pressure of firing. So in this open bolt submachine gun example, uh, pressure will build until it's high enough that it will break through the brass case, and it'll go pop and you'll usually see a big puff of smoke, um, and it'll throw some brass shrapnel out the ejection port of the gun, but it's sitting there right next to this big open ejection port. There's nothing that's going to contain the explosion. So it just poof, out the side. And as long as your hand's not over the ejection port, no big deal. Gun malfunctions, just cycle a new round and you're, you're pretty much good to go. Now this sort of thing also happens in pistols. Uh, perhaps one of the best known examples was we Remember all hearing about the 40 caliber Glock kabooms because they had an unsupported chamber. And the idea there was in order to feed the 40 caliber cartridge, the profile of the chamber on the Glock barrel left a little bit of brass right down here at the bottom of the base unsupported. And if you had weak brass, say oh, brass that had been reloaded several times, and you had a hot powder charge, you could have a case where as the case started to extract, because this the Glock is, like most handguns today, a recoil operated gun, which means the slide starts to move at the very moment that the bullet starts to move. It's just the slide weighs a lot more so it goes a lot more slowly. But you could pull the brass just a little bit out of the chamber, just enough that the, the pressure inside the cartridge would rupture right at the bottom of the now exposed case and it would blow that gas down into the internals of the gun, down into the frame, blow the magazine out, and it would actually do some damage to the gun, unlike an open bolt gun where that gas explosion is just going straight out in open unobstructed ejection port. So uh, typically with pistols this isn't the sort of thing that, that hurts people. Sometimes it does, but generally pistols are pretty good about containing that energy and directing it away from the user's hand. Uh, we do see problems with, um, well, uh, the other, the places where open bolt uh, detonations are more likely to cause injury are with rifles, because we're talking about much higher pressure cartridges. And there you typically have, um, have a situation where, say, a bolt action rifle hasn't been uh, fully locked in place. You have, uh, say, you've fed one round most of the way in, but not all the way, and you don't have the extractor hooked over it, and you go and you feed another round in hard, and you push the tip, the bullet of one cartridge into the primer of the one that's been chambered. Uh, in a case like that, you've got a little more pressure to build up because that cartridge is all the way in the chamber, there's just no bolt holding it in place. And so the pressure will build, the bullet will probably start to move, and the case will start to come back out, and when it ruptures it will blow gas back out the top of the, the bolt action system or down into the magazine, um, potentially causing damage. There's more brass to get thrown around, you've got higher pressures at work. Um, this is, this can cause injuries. Um, one of the other places we can see an out of battery detonation is in a self-loading or semi-automatic firearm. Let's say you have an overly high pressure cartridge in a gas operated rifle. Well, the bullet's going to go downrange just fine, and let's say in this case the pressure is not so high that it's going to explode the gun because it overwhelms the strength of the locking system. No, the locking system holds just like it's supposed to, but the gas that gets tapped into the operating system is at much higher pressure than it was designed for, which typically means it's going to throw the moving parts of the gun backward much faster than they were designed for, which means that cartridge case is going to start coming out of the chamber sooner than it's supposed to, which means the pressure in it is going to be higher. 
This can all result in the cartridge case gets partially extracted while the pressure still in it is high enough to vent through the brass case that's now exposed. And this can happen on semi-automatic rifles. This is the sort of thing that will happen with, say, Turkish uh, 8mm ammo that has degraded badly and is overly high pressure. Um, I actually have a friend who has a foul magazine that's almost round in profile uh, because some idiot overloaded, preloaded pistol ammo into their rifle cartridges, uh, went and shot it through this foul, and that exact process happened, and it the, the case ruptured and it blew gas downward into the action, into the magazine, and just ballooned the magazine out uh, into almost a cylinder. It was really pretty impressive. Um, this also tends to be the thing that doesn't hurt people unless it breaks the stock uh, somewhere where close to your forward hand. It doesn't typically hurt the hand on the trigger. You can see injuries depending on where the front hand is positioned on the gun, depending on what, where the gas comes out. So um, that's the other type of system. And when you see a picture, the other type of failure, when you see a picture of a gun blown up, I think the first important thing to do when you're trying to figure out what happened is assess, did this happen when the gun was locked or when it was unlocked? Because it makes a big difference as to what the root cause of the problem was uh, and how to avoid it in the future. Now historically, one of the other things that was of concern to firearms manufacturers was cartridge ruptures. So let's say we've got this nice brass cartridge case. Today we're really good at making these, but 100 years ago, 150 years ago, maybe not, well definitely, not quite so much. And if you've got this thing in the, the gun and the locking system works fine, but let's say there's a flaw in your brass and the brass ruptures, because it's supposed to balloon open, seal, and then retract back. Well, what if it balloons open, it's too brittle, crack, get a big gash in the case head of the cartridge. Now you've got gas that's no longer contained by the breech of the gun, and it's gonna vent backwards at, oh, I don't know, 40,000 PSI. This can be really bad to the shooter whose face is really close to that cartridge. So on a lot of early uh, firearm systems, designers came up with ways to mitigate that potential problem, to fail safe their guns. So I have a couple good examples of those because that's the sort of firearm that I'm actually more into. So uh, of course, uh, we'll start with the French. Uh, the French Gras uh, had an improvement made in 1880 to address just this. The French Gras is a basic single shot bolt action mechanism using the bolt handle as a single locking lug. No big deal, right? Well, in 1880 the French realized that this didn't do a very good job of handling uh, a ruptured cartridge and venting gas. And so they added this cutout uh, just behind the bolt head. And there's a matching cut on the bottom of the bolt head itself, which you have a little version there, but they significantly increased it. And what this does is it provides a path of least resistance for gas to come up here and out there instead of back along the bolt into the shooter's face. You'll see it from the ground up on some guns, like the Japanese Arasakas. The Arasaka has a vent hole pre-drilled here. This is, this is the equivalent of a crumple zone in a car. If the cartridge case ruptures and gas is coming back, uh, this is located at basically the very back of the chamber, and gas will vent up and out this hole instead of going down into the magazine or coming back along the, the bolt track into the shooter's face. So the Type 99 has one vent hole, Type 38 has two uh, vent holes right there, uh, and that's what those are for. There were also a variety of different guns that had modifications made to include some sort of gas shielding. Another example we can see on a wide variety of different rifle designs is the idea of having some sort of shield along here to prevent vented gas from coming, just tracking straight backwards along the bolt and hitting the shooter in the face. So the original design of the Lebel allowed exactly that to happen. The French made a couple of upgrades in 1893, and one of them was to incorporate this little gas shield onto the bolt head, which it's all it has to do is divert that blast of gas, should it happen, out to the side, and then it won't hit the shooter, uh, and you have rectified a potential safety hazard. And a lot of other countries did the same sort of thing. So the expanded cocking piece 
shroud at the back of a Mauser 98 is there for the same reason. Uh, this prevents any gas that may get to the back of the bolt here from going, from continuing into the shooter's face. This shield uh, will divert it. And the German Gewehr 88, the so-called commission rifle, has another very obvious example of this, where they just assumed you're going to be a right-handed shooter, and so they modified the back end of a striker with this little protective square block, so that any gas that came down right out the side of the bolt track here would get deflected by that, and not go straight into the shooter's eye. Before we close this out, I want to look at what might have been able to be done to avoid the situation that Scott at Kentucky Ballistics found himself in. And I don't want to blame him, and I don't want to blame the firearm manufacturer over this. This was uh, fundamentally a, a sequence of events that took a lot of different things going wrong in a row. But what's nice about that kind of problem is that if you can mitigate any one of that those elements in that chain of, of events, you can prevent a potentially tragic outcome. So let's look at a couple of the things that might have interrupted this flow of events. The most important one to me is if you're out on the range doing something, well, I was going to say if you're out on the range doing something atypical or old ammo or weird guns, but this actually applies to all firearms, because you never know, it's always your responsibility to be safe with whatever it is you're shooting. And I would say, you need to understand what's supposed to happen, and you need to be aware of what is happening, and if the two don't match, you need to find out why. If you're shooting and something's just odd, something doesn't seem right, stop. Figure out what is actually going on and whether or not it does cause a potential safety hazard. So in this case, uh, Scott mentioned that he had a round that went way off of of where it was expected to. He had a round that had a much greater muzzle flash than it should have. This was a sign, and this is incredibly difficult to do, well, not incredibly, this is very difficult to recognize and address in the moment. It's far easier, it's super easy for someone like me to look at it in hindsight and say, oh, well, that was your warning sign right there. That It's, it's hard to notice and appropriately react to those warning signs at the time, but it's also the thing that can prevent incidents like this from happening. Um, when something doesn't feel right like that, stop and assess what you're doing. A really good example of where this can be, can save your gun and maybe save you an injury, is with a squib load. So the idea of a squib is that it's a cartridge that's loaded with a primer but no powder, or very little powder. And what it can do is generate just enough pressure to push the bullet into the barrel, but not out of the barrel. And what that does is that creates the stereotypical bore obstruction. So on a semi-automatic firearm, this generally won't cycle the action, so you'll get a round that sounds weird. The recoil feels weird, weak. The gun doesn't sound as loud as it should, and it'll typically malfunction. If you see that and immediately go to a clearance drill and you're like, all right, tap, rack, bang, that bang is now going to push one bullet into a bullet that's already lodged in the barrel, and it will cause a catastrophic malfunction of the gun that may throw bits of the gun back into you, and that's bad. Um, on a revolver, it can be even more, uh, it can be even trickier to detect uh, if you're not paying attention because you're not expecting the gun to cycle anyway. You get one and the bullet goes in the barrel, and all you have to do is pull the trigger again and you'll detonate the gun. So if you're hand loading, be extremely aware and careful that you put a powder charge in every round. It's as important as making sure you don't put two powder charges in any of the rounds. Uh, if you are competing and you're on the clock and time is of the essence, and you get a weird recoil like that, stop. Like, it's not worth the safety, it's not worth your gun blowing up on the clock. Uh, it, just forget your score. Um, take a, a mulligan if the competition you're in allows it, or just accept that, well, that's not happening. Uh, I'm, I'm not getting, I'm DNFing this stage this day, uh, because it's far better to be safe and to recognize it to nine times out of ten, you misread it, there is no squib, you're fine. But that one time is all it takes to explode a gun in your hand, and we don't want that. Uh, and the same thing applies to odd ammunition, new guns, Outside squibs are the most common way that this happens, but if something's weird, stop and figure out why.
So uh, with that in mind, I think that's about all I really have on the subject. It is Kentucky Ballistics video is a very sobering video to watch. Um, this is a guy that has a lot of experience and he knew what he was doing. And it only takes that one little thing, uh, well it takes a number of things, but you only have to ignore one or two little things in a row to have what was potentially a legitimately lethal result. He spent a couple days in trauma and something like 10 days in the hospital as a result of this gun detonating on him. So um, might be a little bit of a difficult video to watch, but very sobering. If you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to watch it as, uh, you know, don't, don't let it make you paranoid uh, about shooting in general, but this is what can happen when a, a number of things go wrong in a row and nothing interrupts the cycle. It's also a, a good uh, motivation for, it. this will help you understand why certain aspects of firearms are designed the way they are, is to either prevent this sort of thing or mitigate it should it happen. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Um, if you're interested in more along these lines, more discussion of specific failure modes or firearms that are particularly notorious for exploding historically, let me know down in the comments and perhaps we'll do some more on it. Uh, but until then, thanks for watching.